ഇല്ലാഹി റബ്ബിൽ ആലമീൻ റഹ്മാൻ റഹീം മാലിക് യൗമിദ്ദീൻ ഇയ്യാക നഅബുദു വഇയ്യാക നസ്തഈൻ ഇദ്ദിന അസ്സറാത്തൽ മുസ്തഖീം സിറാത്തൽ ലദീന അൻഅംത അലൈഹിം ഖൈറിൽ മഖ്ദൂബ് അലൈഹിം വലത്തല്ലീൻ ആമീൻ ആമീൻ Allahumma amin. Um, am I to start? Miriam is, Miriam is going to come up shortly. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi everybody. Um we welcome you to today's session um which is going to be anchored by our Imam um Brother Jibril Saba. Brother Jibril Saba um is currently the EDHR at IHS Stars and is an Imam of um the Workers Mosque at Araromi. He's also a very good friend of Mika. Without further ado, um i'll ask that he he it takes over thank you very much tay jazakallah khairan a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin was salatu was salam ala al ashraf al anbiya wal mursalin sayidina muhammad wa ala ali wa ashabihi ajmain اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري وللقدات من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم امين اللهم لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد اذا ما رضيت ولك الحمد بعد اريد ولك الحمد ابدا 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 الحمد لله we give all thanks we give all adoration all gratitude returns to almighty allah the lord of the worlds we thank him for all that he continues to do for us we attest that he is the merciful and he is always merciful he is the lord um of the day of judgment um we pray to him we commit to him we turn our worship to none other uh, than him and we ask him almighty allah to guide us to the straight path to make what we are about to share this afternoon easily understandable for all of us easily adaptable for us in our daily lives and that he inspires us to action that meets with his pleasure and earns us the higher station of his jannah allahumma amin so i want to thank the organizers uh for inviting me um to speak um here um I'm a long time friend of Mika like my brother Abdul Rashid said my brother that shares the same name with my father I love you for no other reason but the sake of Allah may almighty Allah is your path and continue to make you amongst the rightly guided um so I I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here uh to share this few minutes uh with you um I'll be speaking broadly 
uh, based on my experiences, when we're talking about the career base, I'll, I'll, I'll talk strictly about my career. I also happen to be an executive coach and I, I don't have the license, I have the permission to share people's personal experiences where I've coached people with you, but I'll try as much as possible um, to, to give an aggregated view of some of the commonalities in what I see uh, from my work as an executive coach um, in my career and how all of this um, ties into this topic of being uh, the career being a path to worship. I mean, Almighty Allah make it easy. Just a quick uh, correction. I am not an ED uh, yet. Maybe I should put yet there. I think my brother was just uh, praying for me. Um, may Almighty Allah make it so. May Almighty Allah elevate all of us, accept our prayers, and um, all our wishes for ourselves, career-wise, dean-wise, for our children, for our nation. May Almighty Allah um, accept all of them. Type. Um, <clears throat> We uh, begin from where Allah permits us to begin, um, talking about the issue of uh, faith, iman, and acts of worship. Um, for a lot of us, unfortunately, these two things run in parallel. You know, our worship, our acts of ibadah, do not in any way influence um, our behavior. So we do not therefore see in a lot of people who profess the faith of Islam, conduct that um, endorses what Almighty Allah um, created us for. So we see people who have a lot of ibadah, but it has no bearing on what we see of them as a human being. And in the same way, we have people who are non-Muslims, but their conduct, subhanAllah, to a, a large extent, um, conforms with the dictates of what of the way Almighty Allah wants us to live our lives. So, for us as Muslims, um, Islam is a complete and systemic way of life. It is fully integrated. I cannot have a career separate from my deen. You know, both of them are not mutually exclusive. You should be able to see aspects of my deen in the way I conduct myself as a human being in the way I conduct myself in my career, and vice versa. Islam is not something we do. It is something we are. That's why we're called Muslims. And if it does not reform your character or elevate you above our basest instincts as man, then there is something that isn't quite right. Allah says in Surah Al-Teen, Allah, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, Laqad khalaqna l'insana fi asani taqwim. We created man in the finest state. Then reduced him to the lowest of the low. And except those who believe and do good deeds. So, and I'll talk about this in a bit, uh, but just in summary, Allah says he has created us in the finest of states. Through the conduct of some of us, we reduce ourselves to the lowest of the low. Except for who? Those who believe that have Iman, profess Iman, have Iman, exhibit Iman, and do good deeds. Allah also says, and, and to buttress the point on Islam being the, the perfect fit, where there is no separation between who the person is and his deen. One reflects the other. He said in Surah to rum uh, chapter 30 of the Holy Quran, verse 30, that so prophet, as a man of pure faith, stand firm and true in your devotion to the religion. This is the natural disposition God instilled in mankind. There is no altering God's creation, and this is the right religion. And this is the right religion, though most people do not realize it. 
So it is part of our natural fitra, the, the way we are, the way our natural disposition is that of being Muslims. Therefore, it must reflect in all that we do and all that we are. Let's move on to the next slide. <clears throat> I have a problem with my keyboard. Okay. So I was talking about my um, work as an executive coach. Almost everyone I see in my um, coaching practice is dealing with some form or the other of the following statements that I've shared here. They're stuck in a job they don't like. They do not think they're growing. Their efforts are not being appreciated or recognized. They do not believe they're making a meaningful contribution. Um, they can't find meaning in their job, um, or they don't even have a job, or they don't feel they're doing enough for the dean. And, you know, what brings them to coaching usually is that they feel that something is missing, or something that used to work for them is no longer working as it did, or there is some sort of emptiness, and these sort of questions for which they have no answers. And I mean, at different times in our lives, we would all come into this sort of existential crisis where we feel that there is, there has to be more to life than the way in which I am living. And, you know, um, if, we, if we go back very quickly to the Quran again, and look, talking about this issue of the integrated form of the, the way we live our lives, the way we earn our keep and our religion and, and the practice of it not being too mutually exclusive bits, we come to this admonition uh, and this, this statement, this maxim that Allah has left us with in Surat Al-Nam, towards the end of Surat Al-Nam. And I particularly like this visual uh, that, that comes with this slide because it shows something of thriving, of growth, of, of full bloom. Allah says, we should say, Kul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mamati our prayers, our sacrifice, our leasing higher, and our death are all for Allah alone, the Lord of the world. So everything, therefore, that we do is an act of worship. Our prayers, yes, that's very clear. Our sacrifices in, obe in obeying the things that Allah has told us to do, our living and the way in which we earn the living and the way in which we use the life, and our death is for none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the world. Which brings me to a question that I would usually start off my executive coaching sessions with when we meet somebody who is in a sort of existential crisis like this one. And I'd like to invite you, if you're listening and you have access to the chat room, to please um, share with me your answers to this question. If you were asked, what do you make? Yeah, forget the other subtext under this. If you are asked, what do you make? What do you intend, um, what, what would your response be? You came to me to discuss this issue of, look, uh, Brother Jibril, I don't know, I've got a good job, you know, I like the people I work with, but I just feel like something is missing. I think my life, should mean a lot more than what is um, the way I'm living it right now. I think I should be making a more powerful contribution to humanity. So and then I ask you, okay, I've, I've, I've heard all of this. What, what do you make? So with the time Allah has given you, with the life Allah has given you, with the faculties Allah has granted you, with the intelligence, the, the, the koam, the strength, you know, what do you make with these? So I'm seeing some really good answers here, making an impact, meaning, um, leaving a great legacy, meaning, sense of purpose, self-fulfillment, impact. I don't see anybody making a ton of money. Maybe that's partly where the problem is. Anybody making, a, ah, okay, someone, making money, someone's making results. And all of these are excellent answers. But the trick here is I create value through my work, serving others and getting paid. Precisely meaning, compassion, humility, while at it. 
is that these are not things that are mutually exclusive. So there's a hint in the subtext, enough money to be able to give back. So I'll just move out of the chat room real quick. Sorry if I didn't get to your contribution. Um, a lot of the responses you would get would fall into those two broad categories. People who want to make meaning or feel they're making meaning in the world or want to be able to make a meaningful contribution in the world. And then people who are making something that speaks to economic activity, um, some form of productivity in the modern sense of it, in the economic, uh, economic um, sense of it. Um, the modern workplace is a place where um, people aspire to have their income producing work also be their meaning producing work. And I'll say that again. A lot of people in the modern workplace aspire to have their income producing work also be their meaning producing work. And the research shows that this is a very recent phenomenon because maybe the amount of time people spend in the modern workplace versus like five, six decades ago, where work was somewhere you went to and something you did, versus now where work permeates every single aspect of your life and you're constantly working. We have this uh, joke about this working from home that some of us have had to do uh, because of COVID, that it's not really working from home, it is living at work. You know, the work just never stops. Um, and Therein lies some of the a challenge a lot of us have in the sense that before now, your income producing work was separate from your meaning producing work. Um, I don't know if this is making a lot of sense. Your income producing work was separate from your meaning producing work and they happened in different places. So I went somewhere to earn income and then in some other areas, I participate in an association like MICA, like Ansarudin, um, where I am doing something about the social system or with a couple of other people in an NGO or a charity I support. And then our fathers and forefathers had all those many, many social clubs they belong to, which um, partly fulfill their need to socialize and be in the company of others. But they also, through that vehicle, addressed several issues within society, scholarships for indigent students, um, maybe sponsorships for uh, people, uh, people's business to raise capital for them and things like that. So where people found meaning was separate from where they earned um, an income. But that has now become so blurred that we now live in a world where people expect that the work where I pour my life forth to earn an income, to, to, to earn my fair share of standing in this, in this uh, society, should also be where I draw um, meaning from. And there are no right answers as to whether this is the correct way to look at this or not. Um, it depends on each person's personal circumstance. And that's what brings me to um, my next slide. Your what you would call your um, maker mix. So I borrowed this from a book called Designing Your Work Life. Uh, the gentleman who wrote the book, uh, have two books uh, with similar titles. One is Designing Your Work Life. Um, the other one is um, Designing Your Life, just your life, not your work life. And this maker mix, um, I invite you all to just listen very attentively for the next uh, 10 minutes because this is the crux of everything I intend to talk about. So when we have somebody come into um, a, a place of coaching with the sort of questions that we started with, and we ask them the question, what do you make? You know, and they're gonna go round and round and give several answers, trying to get to an answer that sounds excellent, even if that's not what they're making, but they feel like it's aspirational, somebody who, makes this sort of thing, you know, uh, mashallah, this person is a good human being. But that's not the case with, with, with all of us. That's, that's never our reality. So my invitation to you today is to look at what you make in three buckets. One is money, your economic output. One is impact, 
and the third one is expression. These are the three different ways in which we can measure what we make at work and in our lives. And it is in achieving congruence in these three facets, these three areas, that you can begin to experience some wholesomeness. Yeah? For the market economy, we measure all that we produce by the naira, the dollar, the pound selling, whatever currency you earn or store your income in. Um, for, for impact, which we call the making a difference economy, um, it's all about the impact you're making in society. And for creativity, it's about how you measure expression. Um, now, money. Is it inherently a bad thing? No, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us in Surah al Qasas, chapter 28 of the Old Holy Quran, verse 77, preceding this verse is the story of Karun, a very rich uh, gentleman in the time of Nabi Musa, alayhi salam. And in verse 76, Allah has just finished telling us about how it takes, I think, about 70 men to carry the keys that unlock the vault where he keeps his money. So, I mean, so that we don't see money as a vulgar thing, because we know from the, from the story, from the coffers, that this individual then, you know, um, lost himself because of his wealth, lost his way. And um, it's a cautionary tale um, for all of us. But so we don't go away with a view thinking that money is vulgar. Allah then says in the following verse, And do not neglect your rightful share in this world. The verse starts with the uh, phrase, Seek the life, seek the life to come by means of what Allah has granted you. But, but do not neglect your rightful share of this world. So yes, we must um, go for our rightful share of this world. Allah has made a provision for each of us of the bounties, of the benefits that he has created in this dunya. And we must go after our share. But then we mustn't blindly uh, pursue that. Um, in in doing this, we must, for, we must not forget the role that we have to play in the world as Allah's vice regent, Silafa. And there are about nine verses we could quote on the subject um, of Khilafah. But one that is very uh, pertinent to this discussion, again, is what you'll find in Surah Al-Anam, chapter 6 of the Holy Quran, verse 165, where Allah says, um, It is he that جَعَلَكُمْ خَالِفَ الْأَرْضِ That made you successors on the earth. وَرَفَ أَبَادَكُمْ فَوْقَ بَادِ darajah and raises some of you above others in rank. For what reason? To test you through that which he gives you. Your Lord is swift in punishment, yet he is most forgiving and merciful. The key part of this ayah is where Allah is telling us that he has made us successors on the earth and he raises some of us above others in rank to test you through what? What he has given you. So those people who said something about wanting to give back, making an impact, wanting to give back out of the bounties of what Allah has granted to them. I mean, they are also very correct um, in the sense that, um, you know, this is part of why we're here. Um, every single um, generation aims to leave the earth better than it found it for the succeeding generation. That's part of um, our, our charge on earth, the sustainability call. And then the last one, expression. Allah also expects us um, to apply our creative efforts um, in the way in which we, we live in the dunya. And if you go to Surah al Tawabun, chapter 64 of the early Quran, verse 3, Allah says, Auzu billahi wal ardi It is he who created the heavens and the earth bilhaq, for, on truth, for a true purpose. Wa He formed you 
and made your forms good. Yeah? So, in a sense, in the tafsir, there are a few of the uh, mufassir who talk about um, the physical form, the arms in the right place, the legs in the right place, the neck, the head, the elegant form, the perfect form. It's balanced. It's not crooked. Everything is in the most appropriate place such that anybody trying to design the form of man follows this exact example um, that Allah has left because there is no better example. But it transcends the physical form. That's what we see in some other tafsir. In the sense that some of us are created with certain expressive gifts, gifts that are translated in expression in the world um, to, uh, uh, um, at a higher level than what has been granted to others. Some people have the gift of the garb. They're able to speak and influence people to action. Some people can write. Until today, we keep reading their writing and we're amazed at their use of word, that the balaga in what they've, what they've written, the depth of it, the use of rhetoric. Um, some of us are gifted in design. Some of us are gifted with the, the, the ability to draw in the arts. Some of us are good at organizing, bringing people together for a purpose, influencing, persuasion, um, combining multiple disciplines. Um, you know, with the polyglots amongst us, people who can write, paint, design, create, engineer, you know. And, and Allah says, he's the one that created you in this form. He formed you in this way. He formed you and made your form good. Now, if you neglect any of these three, because you are blindly in pursuit of one, you would feel some emptiness. And what do I mean? So you see the yellow mark I tried to put on the sliders here of this person's uh, make a mix. This is someone who's pursuing money flat out, you know, um, and he's not really applying any part of his time or effort to the area of impact or expression. He will feel some emptiness. He would come to some place at some point where he feels like, look, I'm really successful at what I do. Um, I like what I do, um, but I just don't feel, I think that there is more I should be doing. This is what you hear from him or her. Now, there could be somebody else who has the black sort of like make a mix. Yeah, not quite there in terms of maximizing the economic output they could produce or things they could earn. Um, and, but they are there trying to make an impact. Maybe they're volunteering their time with Micah, you know, once in a while, popping in, helping with some um, of their outreach programs or the charity things they do or they serve on the board. You know, but it's the commitment of, say, maybe a fifth of their time. And maybe they're also able to write. They've been given the, the, the ability to, to um, they can sit down, they can synthesize ideas and put thoughts out in writing um, to, to help people, maybe synthesizing their own experiences or simply just telling some stories. Um, but again, not applying so much of their time to it. So I think you get the gist. Whether it's the yellow or the red or the black, it signifies what we've seen and it, as examples, these are not like real people, of how some people have their mix, their make a mix. And I'm going to invite you to maybe just in the chat box, drop what you feel your own make a mix is. So if say on money, you could go from zero to 10, impact from zero to 10, expression from zero to 10. You could just put something like 935. If your money is nine, your impact is three and your expression is five. Just for the fun of it, let's just see what people see as their own um, make and mix. So let, let's see that. 935, 792, um, 0, 10, 10, it could be anything. So let, let's see in the chat what your what you, what you feel your present make and mix is. The name of the book is Designing Your Work Life. Thank you, I see a 388. I see a 358. Four eight eight seven eight eight two three five 
575-678-798. Great. Thank you all so much for being such great sports. Now, here's the thing. Um, there are very, very few people in the world who would be able to share with you a 10, 10, 10, for instance. And where you are with your maker mix depends on where you are in your career. I'm only sharing this so that you could do some sort of like self-assessment to see, in case you have some of the questions I started with, to see, okay, how can I nudge my maker mix so that I might find a bit more fulfillment in areas that I am neglecting, particularly those areas where I know that I am naturally gifted by Allah to contribute. So I'm putting a lot of time into producing some economic output, but I'm on like four or five, you know, um, and that's where all my time is going. I really want to do something on impacts where I'm on like two. I want to do something expressive, creative, where I'm on like three, you know, and this is where the emptiness is. The, the solution is self-evident to you. It's about then looking at where you're spending most of your time. So if this was like a coaching session, after the person comes with the initial make and mix and we see where they might be experiencing some gaps, we then try to find out how are you allocating your time. Chances are they could be suboptimizing in that they're spending a lot of time in an area where they're not experiencing a lot of fulfillment. So I live in Ikorodu, but I work in VI, um, I have an average paying job, but 70% of my waking moments is either commuting to that work or coming back or being at work. And these other areas um, suffer therefore because in the 30% that is left, I need to be there for my family. You know, I need to uh, be, be participating in some, maybe you're doing some evening schooling or something. So there's no time for much else, you know, and then we start the conversation from there. But if you take anything away from what I've shared on this particular slide, it's that as Muslims, we are expected to contribute in each of these facets. There's no one area that is frowned on by this dean. You need to find the right balance for yourself where you are earning to the maximum of your potential because Allah has created a share for you in the wealth that he has created with the world. You need to make an impact you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the world of what we call making a difference. And then also you have to um, deploy your creative talent. Now, I want to spend a bit more time just talking about the impact bit. So the other thing we'll do with a client, and I know I think I have about 15 more minutes, um, is the impact mapping. You know, so we draw something like this. And again, you'll find this um, in, in the book I spoke about, Designing Your Work Life. And this is somebody's impact map. You know, um, sorry, I scribbled all over it, but I'll try to make sense of my scribbling um, in a bit. I hope this works. So for this individual here, um, this is somebody who is a teacher. He teaches economics. She teaches economics. Yeah. On the Y axis, we're looking at the point of the impact the person makes. Is it near, more personal to them or far? More like a global um, impact that they're making. And on the X axis, we go from renew, repair to um, sustaining and supporting all through the axis to the other extreme of creating something totally new. So if you're renewing, and repairing, it means you are rebuilding or fixing existing systems and what works in the world. If you are sustained to support, then you are involved in running the systems that run the world and making sure they run well. And then in creating new, new things, it means you're creating a whole new process or system. So this person teaches, they teach economics. They make this sort of impact, which is more like close, I mean, these are the end their, their income, yeah? Um, on the renew to repair uh, a scale, it's more sustained because, I mean, people have been teaching in this world for a very long time. Um, so the, the, the impact, the type of impact is more of a sustaining impact. But the person also offers pro bono classes. 
So here they're trying to fix what is wrong in the world. They offer pro bono classes to indigent students, um, remedial economic classes. And then they're also involved in curriculum development. You know, so they feel there's something wrong with the way in which we, we, we teach people economics. So they and a couple of their friends have gotten together and rethinking the entire curriculum um, of um, economics. And you can see that this is a bit further away from the person now, moving more towards global. On the type of impact, the person is also involved in some work around schools without borders. They're beginning to reimagine schools and they're saying, you know, people don't need to actually go to a physical school. The school doesn't need to have a fence and some classrooms and some desks. Um, using technology, how can we reach more people um, around the world without the need for them to leave their homes and villages to go to school? So this is the same individual just working with all the gifts that Allah has granted to them. So schools without borders is something more towards creating the new new on the type of impact. And here, they're also involved in MICA, um, working with a group of people to design a Taka full health insurance. And I'll talk about that in a bit, because they, they, they used to do hospital visitations as part of their work with MICA, they were on the committee that did hospital visitations, liberating people from death who couldn't get uh, released from where they were receiving treatment because um, they couldn't pay their bills. So they had some people send them some money. I mean, they've shared the MICA account number there, and that's some of what MICA does with the money. So they go, they 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 go to the hospitals, they see people, and Phil Recobi uh, is repeated several times in the in the uh, in the Quran to 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 to, to uh, set free slaves, these people have been enslaved by debt. So they, they but then this this a group of them came together and said, oh, this is not sustainable with the amount of money we are paying that I see on the average that we pay to get people released. This is something health insurance can take care of, but the health insurance, as is generally known, really doesn't um, is not halal but there is the careful health insurance. How do we get that done? So this person is volunteering some time there. And that impact is now moving more towards global and something new. This person also is working on how do we improve access to funding for some of our brothers and sisters that are into trading or have some entrepreneurial uh, drive and the big challenge they have is capital to either grow their businesses or to even start. So they volunteer some time, maybe by working with people who help people with accessing grants. So your grant application letter, how to write a grant application letter to the right sort of like um, uh, bodies who would um, give you grants and stuff like that. Now, because they're an economic, an, an economic teacher and, a, and an economist, um, they, they have their own contribution into this entire process of how do we help and train people to get improved access to funding. And then finally, the person also shares their experience speaking on the MICA platform. Um, so sharing their experience, um, helping others to learn from their experience, helping others to answer questions that they might have um, for which they are maybe a better uh, position to help answer and address. So that could be somebody's Im impact map. This is not one human being. I mean, this is not several people. This is one human being who is making an impact all over an impact map like this. Now, the thing is, sometimes you work with clients and their impact is sort of like limited to this quadrant or limited to that quadrant, and it is not balanced. Again, the way to, to experience wholesomeness is for all of this to be in balance. Now, in the next five to 10 minutes or so, I will now try to move it towards, so people might be asking, okay, this is all well and good, but how does this answer the question of uh, being the path to worship? Everything I've described here is 
um, part of living, you know? And we shared that verse from Surah Al-Anam at the beginning, my inna salati, my prayers, uh, wa nusuki, my uh, sacrifice, wa mahyaya, my living, wa mamati, my death, lillahi rabbil alameen, uh, all for who? Allah alone, the Lord of the world. So everything we do is a form of worship. That's, as Muslims, that's who we are. Every action that we, 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 um, Allah has been, has granted us the good fortune to enact in obedience to his own laws and dictates is an act of worship for which we will be rewarded. Now, I'm not going to have a lot of time to answer this. Okay, and I've got all these squeegees um, to complete this. I've got all these squeegees on my screen now. Let me find a way to clean this. Um, so. so I think this should actually be uh, content for maybe another lecture, but let's see how far we go with this. And please stop me at any time um, once you feel um, we, we seem to be running out of time. Now, looking at the, I think it's called the Journal of Islamic Thought. There's some researchers that have gone into the Quran and have come up with this guidelines for generic skills. Now, generic skills are defined as a set of skills that are directly related and needed for the working environment. Employers usually prefer to recruit of people who are competent in things like interpersonal skills, leadership skills, teamwork, oral and written skills. I should know I've, I've been in HR for quite a while. But the beauty of Islam is that Allah has provided guidance towards our development in the world in a manner that maximizes our unique abilities and sets us apart, you know, as the best example created for all of mankind. So in the Quran, there are verses which mention things like communication, collective work, lifelong learning, problem solving, the overall personal, uh, personality development, and living our life and career in congruence uh, with worship requires that we fall back on this guidance provided by Almighty Allah and His Messenger. And in doing so, only then um, can we be assured of success. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Insan, We have guided him, this insan, this man, woman that we have created, We've, we've, we've guided them to the right path, whether or not they're grateful. Gratitude is displayed by obedience and embodying the commandments of our Creator. Um, ingratitude has its seeds in disobedience, and when it has now fully germinated, it is gafla or heedlessness. So let me see if I can quickly talk about communication and maybe collective work um, in the time that we have left. Um, can I ask how much time have we got so I know not to prattle on for too long? You have, you have seven, seven more minutes. Seven. Mm. Okay, okay. So um, let's do this then. There's something I just remembered on the Mecca matrix. Depending on where you are in your life cycle as well, certain elements of it become less pronounced. So the older you get, for instance, the, 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 the drive for money, for instance, would of course take a back seat. And now you're more concerned about spending time on impact and expression. But I'll, I'll allow that to come out organically in the question and answer if it hasn't been understood that way. With the stage you are in your life cycle also determines your make and mix. You could also have the wrong make and mix at a particular stage in your uh, in your life cycle, which is what is creating the problem of a lack of sakina, tranquility um, in your life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran uses, um, sev talks about communication in several ways. Um, and one of them is um, the word wasil. Um, the word communication in academic usage is called um, itisal, from the root word wasal, um, wow, sword, lamb. 
which means to cause something, to reach somewhere, to bring about something. Um, and the verbal noun is watan. And Allah says in Surah Al Qasas, chapter, uh, chapter 28 of the Holy Quran, verse 51. We have caused our word to come to them so that they may be mindful. And besides wasal, Allah uses quite a few other words in the Quran to carry the meaning of communication. Um, the Prophet ﷺ says about communication in a hadith we, we, we received from Wad ibn Jabal, he says, Verily, you will continue to be safe as long as you remain silent. If you speak, to be recorded for you or against you. And these are several other sort of like um, words that Allah uses to describe communication in the Quran. Allah from to, to give words, to give uh, uh, admonition, wasi as we call it, and so Allah to ask a question. And you, you, I was going to spend time going a bit deeper into like six constructs of um, of the call of of to the, the, to to speak, and and in different places we see Allah use the form kaula stedida um, to speak words of appropriate uh, justice, kaula maisura, kaula mahruf, kaula laim, kaula kareem, kaula balag, and these are various forms of communication that refer to specific instances and how we must conduct ourselves. So you see how basic communication, which is a requirement for you to engage in the world, could also be an act of worship if you use the communication in the right way. You know? So Kaula Shadida, for instance, Allah says in Surah Al-Azab, Ya you are lazina amanu, takullaha wa kulu kaula shadida. Believers, be mindful of Allah. Speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose. Kaula sedida, you know. And Allah, the Umar uh, Radiallahu Anhu says, I have never regretted my silence, but as for my speech, I have regretted it a lot, you know. And then there's also the hadith of the Prophet Sallam where he says, because the person who is sedid, yeah, he is truthful. He is on. He is straightforward. He's on the path of mustaqim. He's somebody who calls mustaqim. He's somebody who's straightforward. He's somebody who values istiqama, which means to be honest. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Alaykum bi sidqi. You must be truthful. Fa inna sidqa yadi illa al birri. Verily, truthfulness leads to righteousness. Wa inna al birra yadi illa jannah. And righteousness leads to paradise. A man continues to be truthful and encourages honesty until he is recorded with Allah as being truthful. So being truthful is in compliance with Allah's law, is in obedience to what he has commanded us to do. You are truthful in your career, in your work. It's a form of worship. You get rewarded for it. Kaulan mahrufa, derived from the word urf, which means something known to people, their custom. You know, kaulan mahrufa is inviting people to all that is good, enjoining what is right, forbidding what is wrong, encouraging and leading people to all that is commendable and to avoid all that is forbidden. You know, so we've got one minute left. So let's move from communication skills and let me speak about at least one more. Amal Jami, this is important. Collective work. This has two essentials, Ta'ruf and Tafahum. Um, Ta'ruf, you find in the Quran, in Surah Al-Hujra, chapter 49, verse 13, um, where um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to us about the reason why he created us with differences, that we might come to know each other, Lita Arafu. So that we might know each other. So we come together, understand each other's differences, understand where one party might be lacking. Maybe economically, they need some support. Um, socially, they need some support. There's some help we can, we can offer. It, it, it fosters the fahum, which is mutual understanding 
having common goals and objectives, working towards um, some kind of um, an end goal and objective in mind, where we all come together to address a social issue. Um, for instance, this is all part of um, Tafahum. And then th there are two practices of Amal Jame, which is the um, um, Ta'awun, which means um, to help one another. And Allah tells us in the Quran, in Surah Al Maida, chapter 5, verse 2, help one another to do what is right and what is good being part of platforms like this like the like mica and not just attending their sessions but really going in to find out how can i contribute is the movement for islamic culture and awareness how can i contribute how can we help what can i do how can i use my expertise what god has granted me or what i've managed to study or allah has granted me in terms of intelligence how might i um, use it to help others to what is right and what is good. And, and then the other practice is the practice of takaful, which means to kind of like look out for each other, to take care of each other, to safeguard each other, you know, to be responsible um, for each other. The word takaful comes out in a description um, in uh, Surah Al-Imran, where Allah is describing um, um, the mother of uh, Isa, Maryam, alayhi salam, and, and, uh, and Zakaria, and, and he's saying, Allah is saying, Waqafa Allah Zakaria, that we entrusted her to the charge of Zakaria. So Takaful is where those of us who are kind of like um, fortunate understand our responsibility to care for those less fortunate and to continue to build systems which in a dignified manner helps them also to be able to hold their heads up in society to pull them out from the doldrums where they are and set them on a path because allah has granted us by virtue of what he has given to some more than others we're able to use that to improve their lot um we don't have so much more time unfortunately um i'll, I'll leave you with this Quote from the Prophet Muhammad where he says, Man bihi khayran, fi din. Whoever, Allah, whoever Allah intends goodness, He gives him understanding of the religion. May Almighty Allah grant us all an understanding of the religion such that in our practice of the religion, it transcends ritualistic practice and it becomes embodied in a manner that is demonstrable and visible for all others to see. And may all of this be um, acts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us all for. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for that. That was a very rich presentation. May Allah continue to bless you and enrich your knowledge and continue to give you opportunities like this to spread and share your knowledge with. Um, the um, I'm going to look if we have any questions. I haven't cited any. Please, if you have any questions, can you please send it in the chat box so Mr. Jibril can answer those for us? Okay, there's one question. In a situation well, whereby you need money to make impact and expression, but you're not getting it where you work, what do you do? This is a very good question. Um, thank you very much, and, and, and thank you for your prayers. Um, Almighty Allah answer all your prayers as well. Um, it's not every form of impact or expression that requires money. And that's one of the things, I think one of the reframing that we all need to do. Um, a lot of people are waiting until they have um, money before they are able to make a contribution. But um, that, that's not entirely accurate. That's a life sentence some of us pass on ourselves and then they become like um, self-fulfilling prophecies because then we don't think we have enough money and therefore we're not making an impact, therefore we're not making use of our creative strength and therefore we feel some emptiness and we don't feel we're living a wholesome life. So um, if you don't have money to contribute in the way you desire to, why don't you check? You can contribute your time. Do you know time is more valuable than money? You can contribute your expertise. 
there will be areas in which you are more gifted um, than other people and your contribution um, could, um, could, could be very impactful. impactful. You, could be, you could be somebody that has the call of the league. You speak deep, penetrating words that are able to move people to action. That doesn't require money. So these are other ways in which you could think about um, the contribution that you, you intend to make that, um, do not re that, does not require, um, that does not require money. And may Almighty Allah help, help you to all that is right um, and leads back to him. Amen. Okay, the second question here is, I want to switch from one career to another. I seem lost and not sure of the best approach. Kindly advise how to, how do I use the medium to get clarity? Great. So, yes, so th th this comes up a lot as, as well. Um, and it's partly because for a lot of us, I mean, in order to earn income, we take on just about any job that presents itself. And that is a very sound strategy. Um, you can't wait for the perfect job to land on your laps before you start um, working and earning money. But the, the question usually is this, though, for people that want to change their careers. Um, there, there are three things that we would ask you. Um, what's the current quality of developmental options available to you where you are? What's the quality of your um, co-workers' contribution? Uh, do they slag off or do they contribute just as much as you do? So are you working around people where iron sharpens iron? You know, and the last is the quality of the role. What is the level of freedom you have to act in your job? Now, once you've answered those three questions, we then ask you to look at the job you want to go to, this grass is greener on the other side, and answer the same exact questions. If you're moving for money, no issue. You know, make it about money and move. And just know that you'll be dissatisfied very quickly. You would earn the money, but then you would experience quite a bit of dissatisfaction. But if what you're moving for are the things that really are the key. What you have in the other place, one second, I just need to sort this out so that you can hear me clearly. Can you still hear me clearly? Yes. I'm not sure my... Yes, we can. Yeah, not working. We can hear now, you if what you... Okay, no problem. If what you... On the other side, where you intend to go to, um, what you would get in, on these three dimensions, the quality of the role, the quality of the developmental opportunities, and um, the quality of your co-workers is less than where you are right now, the advice would be stay where you are. But if you want to move for money, that's a totally different um, argument entirely because everybody has um, different personal circumstances. But I can assure you that you earn that money for a couple of months. Some of these other things are lower compared to where you're coming from. You'll be dissatisfied very quickly. Hello, Alan. Okay, the next question is, um, there's a constant challenge I find when I invite sisters for business seminars. They say they have to be at Madrasa. However, they, are, they also constantly complain about their business not doing well. How does one balance use of spare time learning Dean or learning to do a better work or business? Yeah, so thank you very much. And this is coming from my, from my dear sister, uh, Wura Ola Young. Um, your mighty Allah continue to be merciful to you and your family. It's good to see you or good to hear from you. Um, okay, so we must always avoid the tyranny of the all, you know, and instead go for the all-embracing union of the and. And this is some argument I have with some of our uh, places of study, um, madrasas, the masjid. Um, I did come to the point um, of those five skills around lifelong learning. And one of the prerequisites is about the institutions that we build. Going to the madrasa should really not be all about learning Arabic and memorizing Quran and tafsir and uh, 
the seerah. We must make the madrasa a place where there is all kinds of learning. So Sister Wurala Young should not feel the need to have to invite people to a business seminar. The madrasa, as part of their natural curriculum, should have that element in their curriculum. Because we all know that, unfortunately, there is a gender bias in terms of economic opportunity, particularly in entrepreneurship. And one of the ways in which we can balance it out is by providing entrepreneurial training to the women who tend to be the ones who build the home and train the children. So the madrasas are the ones I think Sister Urala Young should approach, as opposed to the sisters themselves, such that whatever curriculum she's got to deliver outside of the madrasa becomes integrated into what the madrasa, the masjid, or wherever it is they're spending their time um, is providing to such people. And I hope this is, uh, this is useful. So, yeah. Okay, so I'll read out the next question. Where does family companionship, love relationship come in? Expression, question mark. Those are things that can affect your money and impact greatly. Yes, so this is a very, this is a very good question. Um, so I shared only one tool and you would see that in executive coaching, if you work with a coach, they're usually multidimensional. They don't just look at things from one angle. Remember the question we started with was, what do you make? Yeah, there is a, a supporting question, which is who supports you? Yeah, we ask questions like who supports you? This is where we see what sort of family system you have, accountability system in terms of the people you surround yourself with. We ask you questions like what could get in the way? You know, we ask you what you do with your sorrows. Um, who do you share them with? Who can you talk to about anything, no holds bad? Who loves you unconditionally? Who do you love unconditionally? Because this is what gives us the full integrated 360 degree view of the human being. So what I shared in terms of the maker mix is really about what do you produce? The input that makes you a solid, balanced individual who's able to go into the world and make a meaningful contribution is a totally different conversation, which I did not speak to. But you make a very valid point that they have their own impact on um, how they can affect money. And so I'll tell you what I can tell you. I hope, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so the next question we have here, someone has asked if you can speak a bit about intention relating to this. Intention relating to? So I think the question is a bit incomplete, but it says, speak a bit about how intentions relate to this. How intentions relate to this. Okay, let's take the next question then. Okay, okay. Sorry, I'm struggling a um, bit with that. So the person can ask, uh, ask the question again. Yeah, the it's question wrong. is um, a bit incomplete. The next question we have is, I've heard a lot about building relationships with colleagues and clients. Please share tips and strategies for building relationships, particularly for sisters in a male-dominated industry. Great. So thank you very much for this question. Um, look, I... I'm a strong advocate of what people like Wimbies are doing. The, 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 the dissonance that we see, the imbalance we see, where some industries are said to be male dominated and the rest of it did not happen overnight and it's not going to get corrected overnight. We need to, to get together more advocacy groups, uh, more platforms that um, advance the interests of um, professional women in specific um, industries, and that's how we're going to be able to um, address this imbalance. The women also have to come together to support each other. Um, that's, the, that's the first form um, to start with, because um, in, in Islam, for instance, if you look at the Hadith, um, it, it's unfortunate that a lot of the people who write about Hadith and speak about Hadith nowadays are men, but the majority, more than 50% of the Hadith that we we all refer to were transmitted by women. Nana Aisha radiallahu anha for one, and the wives of the Prophet sallam. So again, that's one area where there's some imbalance that needs to be uh, redressed. The, uh, what's it that they say? You can't clap with one hand 
So the, the sooner we're able to begin to address some of these sort of imbalances, the better balanced society we will get. And that comes from getting the sisters themselves to come together to form advocacy groups, professional um, interest groups um, in areas where we see this sort of imbalances. Thank you for that. Um, the next question we have here is when you work in an extremely toxic environment that also that's also corrupt, to what extent are you responsible for the happenings of the organization, even if you are just there for a short time? So I'm gonna put a shameless plug here for my sister Adebola Idou. Um, she's running, she runs an organization called Gold Digger and she's um, planning a conference, a three-day conference next week. And I'll be, spoke, I'll be speaking there about um, dysfunctional politics in organizations. Um, I think I would spend a bit more time on this sort of like topic there uh, to help the person who's got this question. Um, now, we find ourselves somewhere in extremely toxic environments where people play the wrong type of politics. Um, where it is also corrupt, um, you need to ask yourself what you are contributing to making this happen, um, even if you are there for a short time. Every system that we can see, if you're a part of it, there's something you're contributing, either actively through your participation or by turning a blind eye. If you're not in a position to take action against it because it is detrimental to your own well-being, then pray against it. Uh, speak against it in your heart and ask Allah to make a way out for you as soon as possible because that's not the sort of place that would support your mental well-being talk less of your spiritual well-being okay um the next question we have here is as regards your current topic what's your advice for us students i.e undergraduates who have a huge alacrity for a better future Sorry, I'm just trying to find that question. Okay, let me ask properly, as regards your current topic, what's your advice for us today? Okay, so the, the thing is, um, as a Muslim, the first thing is whatever you apply yourself to, whatever you find yourself doing, ensure that you put in the maximum effort to be the best at it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you that promise. He has stated very clearly that indeed, you are the best example set for all of mankind. Yeah, so do not suboptimize. If you're studying, aim to be the best at what you're studying in, and not just in cramming and, and, uh, and repeating it in an exam. Embody what you're learning such that you could also potentially become a leading figure in this area. This is one area where my heart bleeds for Islam, for instance, because when you think about it, the first university in the world, uh, the Karawin University in Fez, Morocco, was set up by a female Muslim. We talk about 14th century universities like the Sankore University in modern day Mali. You know, it's a citadel of learning that was created by Muslims. In the Abbasid um, era, we talk about the big libraries of knowledge where they brought in people with different backgrounds. Most of the early texts you know, of, um, of, um, of recorded history and knowledge were written in Arabic because the Abbasid Caliph um, incentivized people to study, to combine um, knowledge areas. So we were foremost in this, and that is where we must return to. And that's my advice to students. Do not slack off. Be the best at what you do because Allah has given you that guarantee. The only way you would miss it is when you do not apply yourself. And that would be my advice. What would happen is that when you're the best at what you do, it may take time, but when the opportunity comes, at least you are ready. And nobody is having to give some kind of discount or allowance or quota for you. You know, your, your light will shine through. And, and um, I, I would leave it at that because I see where fast is in daylight. Okay. I hope that um, is helpful. I think we have two more questions. So the next one is, how can I exude executive presence, be one that is an expiring leader, yet fits in, a millennial, in, a, in the millennial teams or at work, also I'm female? 
So um, how much time have we got? Um, we're supposed to finish at, at um, 6.30, so we still have some time. Yeah, I know. It's because the question is multifaceted. I, I can't answer the question um, in, in the form in which it has been asked because there, there are several ways of building executive presence. Executive presence is, a, is an entirely uh, different area of like coaching and personality development and personal effectiveness. But first, start with a solid foundation, which is um, what you know. Yeah? Nobody can take away what you know from you. It is yours. The danger of feeling like an imposter, which is what robs most people of executive presence, comes from feeling as though I do not deserve to be where I am. Wherever it is you find yourself, allow me the possible. Rest in that. It is a firm footing. It's unshakable. If it was not meant for you, well, I, you would not be there. So if you are there, you know, regardless of the doubts you have, rest in the knowledge that Allah is enough for you. Rest in that. And then from there, be sure of what you know. Speak only to what you know. Speak the truth at all times in a measured manner, in a manner that is appealing and acceptable to the people that you're speaking the truth to, not in an obnoxious manner that aims to denigrate people and bring them down. These are the things that help you to build executive presence. You become somebody people want to hear from. You know, the minute you start feeling in your mind that you deserve to be here, you start showing up differently. But if in your head you've not cured yourself of the negative self-talk that you shouldn't be here, you're here by luck, it was, you know, some stroke of fate, you don't even know how you got this, then it will show in the way you present yourself. But like I said, this is a... This is a, a, a long topic, and I, I don't want to get too deep into it before I lose, um, before I lose everybody. And I think there are a few other questions we, we could also attend to here. Yes. Um, the next question says, please recommend books that talk about how our mothers in faith were key in reporting to things. Hmm. So... There are a few I can think of now. Maybe what I'll do is I would send the, I can think of like three, but I want to get the names right. Dr. Yasser Auda has a book. I don't know if um, Abdul Rashid can help me with this. We discussed it a few months ago. I couldn't, I can't get up to go to my bookshelf now to get it. But he writes a book that really talks about the place of women in Islamic history from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu So there are a couple of chapters dedicated. It's a series of essays that he wrote. Um, do, do you remember the title? Uh, if, if he's on, Brother Rashid, you can just help me with that. So there's that. The Return uh, to the in, Mosque. Is something yes, about yes, reclaiming, reclaiming, the reclaiming the Mosque. Reclaim, yes. Reclaiming the Mosque. I think that there are two essays he wrote that are dedicated to this specific subject uh, that Sister Wurola Young is asking about. But the entire, the book in its entirety is a series of essays about how over time we seem to have pushed um, women out of everything that has to do with um, scholarship, being in the mosque, even up to where they are placed in the mosque, the entry, and even some mosques that actually don't have any space for women. And, and it's a very balanced, um, and critique, um, and I'll recommend that strongly. There is a book written by a, a, a woman, um, If All the Oceans Were Ink. If All the Oceans Were Ink, she's, um, I think she's English, and she was following a particular sheikh uh, around who was a professor in Oxford University in the UK. That professor, and if we have some time, I'll check for his name, has a book, um, two volumes, that speak about women's scholarship and actual names of women scholars. Um, and then if you read the, the history um, of Imam Shafi, in his life, there was a female descendant of the Prophet Sallam who um, he either lived with in Egypt when he moved to Cairo um, and he, she was very influential in, in his work, um, 
the Almighty Allah have mercy on him and her. Um, th th these are some, I, I could do a bit of research to get the exact titles and send that through to, um, to Micah and then they can share with, with everybody. Allah Alam. Okay. Um, the next question we have is, I, someone says, I am helping kids choose a career path advice on how to guide them, impact, expression, and money. Sorry, where did you see that one? Is it in the chat or in the q and It No, it's in the chat. Uh, it's from Bura Ola Young. Okay, what, what does the question say again? I am helping kids choose a career path. These yeah. are advice on how to guide them, full stop, impact, expression, and money. So I, I, may, I think she's trying to say, please advise on how to guide them on impact, expression, and money. I'm going to ask you to read the walking Quran um the walking quran i can find it here you know up till i think about three months ago i used to be one of those people who turned up their noses at um, our traditional illegal system until i read this book and discovered um the discovered the um Sorry, I'm just trying to find it on my Kindle. There is the Walking Quran, Islamic Education, Embodied Knowledge and History in West Africa. Rudolf T. Ware. Ware is W-A-R-E. Rudolf T. Ware the third. Um, the Walking Quran. And there, all I'll ask you is to follow the model of the early clerical scholars, the clerical families in teaching the Quran. Because in that method, there is a complete, integrated, rounded form of how to um, influence and train children such that it is embodied. Um, and let the children dream. You know, sometimes we do this kind of work in um, coaching where we talk about role history. And we ask you to, so an example is, um, go back in 10 year late. So let's say the person is 46. Um, go back to when you were 36, to when you were 26, to when you were 16 and when you were six. What roles were you playing in life? What did you dream of becoming in life? And it is amazing how rich the desires of this person were at six. And then we can help them see how through socialization, they started pruning away things they felt were not useful, left behind, and to become who they are at 46. And all we need to do is to ask them to go back to those things and see how they might be able to integrate them back into their lives. There are people that will tell you amazing things like, I used to write all these short stories. I used to draw all these cartoons. I used to tell, you know, some, I used to be able to draw, uh, for instance. I could draw a lot of cartoons and sketches and I lost all of that. No, you didn't lose it. You still have it, you know? So that is looking back. Now, moving forward, if you allow the children to dream and nurture all their gifts equally, yeah? And let them be the ones to decide what they want to keep, what they want to drop. That's another way of um, having a rounded, um, integrated form of this expression impact in, in, raising, in raising children. Wala alam. I hope that answers the question, Sister Orala Young. It does. Thank you for that. And uh, we are on our last and final question. Uh, someone's asking that you please recommend podcasts for personal development and HR. Okay, so, oof. okay. It's a bit of a tough one. So, in terms of podcasts, there is. Um, Uh, something grand. One second, I'm just going to open my own podcast. So there is a particular podcast I love. It has nothing to do with HR. It's called Sacred Footsteps. And this um, amazing people, they go all around the world, um, historical, um, 
Islamic places, mosques and cities, they talk to people, amazing, amazing resource, uh, sacred footsteps. But in terms of HR, so Adam Grant has got, and this is not just about HR, this is generally about uh, people development, organizational development, people management. I think it's called work life. Um, yeah, it's called Work Life with Adam Grant. That's a very good one. And I believe that the folks at CIPD in the UK also have a, also have a podcast that you could uh, listen to. At least those two I can recommend. But for sure, you should try. So is that, is, sorry. So is that Adam Grant or Adam Grant with a D or Adam a T? Adam Grant with a T. With a T. With a T. Right. Okay. Work Life with Adam Grant. Okay, so I think that's every, well, I've gone through every question. Um, can I ask that, yeah, I think that's every question. So I think we can round up, round up this session now. We have another session. Everyone's asking for to bring a part two because everyone's really enjoyed your time here with <laughs> us. But unfortunately, uh, this is the end of this session. Next week, we have another session. Um, topic is rising to the top, the journey of a trailblazer, which is going to be handled by Mrs. Bashirat Otun Ewu. She's currently the an executive at First Bank, and she's going to be joining us next week, same time, 5 p.m. Nigerian time, um, on Zoom. And um, we hope that you have enjoyed and learned something from Mr. Jibril, and you would apply those things that you've learned in your life. Um, can I ask that you please say a prayer for us before we close the session? We hold out hope that all that we have offered and all that we have said, um, Al Almighty Allah counts it in our store of good deeds, that Almighty Allah sees it as an act of service and worship, that He makes the bit of it that would be useful to us, easy to integrate into our lives, and the bits of it that will not be useful to us makes it easily um, forgettable for all of us. We ask for his forgiveness, we ask for his mercy, we ask for his favors. We ask that he surrounds us with his radiance such that our lives are constantly illuminated with his radiance. We ask for his Baraka in all that we do. We ask for his mercy in all that we do. We ask Almighty mm. Allah to inspire us with action that he finds pleasing, that will meet with his pleasure and will grant us the higher stations in Jannah. We ask him for those who are still searching for work, that he grants them meaningful employment, gainful employment, and that they are reminded to use this in service um, and in obedience to his laws. We also ask him for those of us who are still looking for ways in which we can make an impact in the world to bring us to the realization that all we need to make an impact is all around us and he eases the path for us to be able to do that. And for the creative strength that he has granted to some of us that are currently not finding any form of outlet for expression that it brings us to it in short order. We ask him for peace in our land, for Sakina in our homes. Um, we ask him for a calm heart, a grateful heart. Um, we ask him to send his blessings on the noble prophet Muhammad Sallam and all our dearly departed friends and family members. We ask him for peace in our nation one more time and that in finding peace in our nation, we all find our space in which we can be truly grateful to him for the message that he has granted to us. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa ilam tanga freelana wa tarhamna la makuna na minal kaatirin. Rabbana la tuzi kulubana ada iza daitana wa adlana mina dunka rahma inna ka anta al-wahab. Rabbana atina fi dunia hasana wa fi lahirati hasana ka wa kina azabanna. Subhana rabbika rabbil izati amaya sirun. 
والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على النبي الكريم امين صلى الله عليه وسلم جزاكم الله خيرا thank you very much thank you thank you for having me thank over thank you too thank you you're welcome it's our pleasure assalamu alaikum alaikum assalam